but he asked me in his stead to make two points. Number one, I want many of you here have been before, but many of you this is the first time. So now you all are official MIT alumni. And you'll be expecting a letter from the alumni donation office by Monday. <laughs> so watch for it in the mail. The second thing I wanted to do, I'm going to be talking about this issue of cybersecurity in an increasingly interconnected and volatile world. So I'm going to ask first a question at the beginning. How many of you know if your organization has suffered some cyber attack of some kind in the past year? Ah, quite a few hands have gone up. Fantastic. We'll talk more about those experiences as we go. But I asked that question in a very specific way. I say, how many of you know if your organization has suffered a cyber attack? In our research and other colleagues, we've discovered the average cyber attack has been going on for 200 days before it's discovered. And it turns out, by the way, more than half those discoveries are done either by an outsider or by accident. So the fact that you don't know you have a cyber attack doesn't mean you don't have a cyber attack. That you'll find out on Monday also, I guess, if you will. Then the other question I have is as follows. We talked a lot in the last session about the issue of the role of the chief data officer or CDO in organizations. And we'll probably hear that theme at other times in this symposium. But I have a different question. How many of you in your organization, and you go by various names, but typically it's called a chief information security officer or CISO? How many have? Let's say it looks like about two thirds of you. That's very good. Now, the reason why I bring that up is I want to talk about a little bit of cybersecurity. Now, unless you've been hiding under a rock, during COVID, it's obviously all of you are somewhat familiar with it, but I want to point out a couple of issues, if you will. First, as all of you probably hopefully realize by now, cybersecurity is more than just the issue of stolen credit cards, which is by the way, probably what Aunt Sally thinks it is. So you know, a lot of people out there and maybe in the organization have that relatively narrow view of it. And obviously all of you in your organizations are working as hard as you can to prevent it. But as the show of hands indicates, it's hard to be completely prevent, uh, preventive, if you will. One of the things we've been looking at here in the Sloan School is the issue of the critical infrastructure. That means our energy systems, you know, chemical, water treatment, telecom, and so on. Now, you may not be in any of those industries, but you depend upon them. And of course, we believe that's an important issue. So one of the things we're researching here at MIT, are what are the cybersecurity risks in those industries, both directly in those industries and the consequence of impact it may have on your industries. Finally, and we're gonna have some speakers during this uh, conference from my colleagues here at the MIT Cyber, uh, Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. And research going on both at MIT and in industry and other universities on improving hardware and software is very important. But in our research and other researches indicate the majority of cyber events are aided or abetted by insiders, usually unintentionally. That's why we believe it's so important to address the managerial, organizational, and strategic aspects of cybersecurity. And that's the reason why we believe that every member in your organization has an important role to play. Okay. So, I mentioned it briefly in passing, we do have an organization we created here at Sloan called Cybersecurity at MIT Sloan, or CAMS. Those who may be interested in more of it, you're welcome to go to a web link when you have a chance. But I want to follow up on two of the phrases in the title for my session here. One of them is the issue of increasingly interconnected world. Now, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this buzzword or term, the Internet of Things, or variations on IOT. It's very simple. The idea is that computers are in everything, even a toothbrush. So this is a, a Bluetooth-enabled to toothbrush. Now, why in the world would you want to have, A, a computer in your toothbrush, and B, have it interconnected to the Internet? Anybody have an idea why you'd ever want to do that? Well, I'll give you three. Oh, yes, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. There's many reasons. I'll give you three reasons. Number one, it gives you a report saying, you know, you've been brushing too much on the left side and not enough on the right side. So it can give you advice on how to brush your teeth better. I bet you never thought that would, that's one of the lessons you probably never learned in college, I bet you. So you've got to learn it sooner or later. The second thing, you may have some kids 
Hey, Johnny, I noticed you only brushed for 30 seconds this morning. Go back upstairs and then brush your teeth and then come down for breakfast. Thirdly, you can connect it to your doc dentist's office to send periodic reports. So when you're going in for your checkup, he can give you further advice on how to do a better job. The reason I mention this, it sounds crazy, but it's almost impossible to imagine some item that doesn't get some added value by putting a computer in it, connect into that. I used to jokingly say the only thing without a computer in it will be a brick. And then someone showed me an article about smart bricks. So maybe I won't be able to say anything will not be included. I want to, but, so there's lots of great benefits to that. But of course, along with those benefits come a lot of new dangers, or I call them attack surfaces. I just want to give you two brief examples. You may have heard of them, but hopefully this will inspire you because I'm sure there are many others out there, some of which I know about, some of which I haven't heard about yet. One of them, just like everything is smart nowadays, you've got smart telephones, you've got you know, smart speakers, and of course, not surprisingly, there are smart refrigerators. Now, why would you want a smart refrigerator? Or well, you may be bored, you want someone to chat with in the kitchen, but more importantly, what they can do is they can, you can be in the supermarket, you can turn on your smartphone, and you can look inside your refrigerator. Oh, gee whiz, I realize I'm running out of eggs, and I better get some more milk. So there are these smart refrigerators. I don't know, maybe it was almost three or four years ago, one of those refrigerators was cyber attacked. And the computer inside the refrigerator was taken control by cyber attackers. So while that refrigerator was pumping out ice cube, it was sending out pornographic spam. Now, as far as you know, what I'm about to say didn't happen, but imagine your front door being broken down by the FBI and your refrigerator being arrested. I mean, that would have been the next step. Obviously, they figured it out enough time to shut it down. The other one, now that's an example on the consumer side. You say, well, we're all corporate people here. Let me give you an example, of at least one example, from the corporate side. I assume many of you have been to these nice, beautiful new hotels. I was at the New York Hilton not too long ago. And they have the ability where you can unlock the door to your hotel room from your smartphone. It turns out there was an Austrian hotel that had been set up that way as well. A cyber attack broke into their computer system and changed all of the lock settings. The good news, you can still manually turn the knob and get out of your room. You just couldn't get back in. And that's an example where we're using computers to improve the operation of our business, whether it be a hotel, or manufacturing, or retail. But of course, having done that, you have to ask yourself the question. Our tendencies ask us up the question, how can this benefit our business? No obvious thing to ask. But you should pause at least for a second and say, what risk am I imposing on my business? And what do I need to do to minimize that risk? That second stage is overlooked in so many cases. So my point here is both as an individual consumer as well as as a corporate individual, you need to think about what are the products you're buying and what are all those great new features, but what comes along with those features. And of course, if you're making these products or adding features to your services and so on, you must say, what new features am I providing to my customers, but also what new risks am I imposing upon my customers? So that's on the interconnected theme. Next, I want to combine the two of them, the issue of interconnected and volatile. And this is a phrase I don't think I've heard a lot about, so I'm trying to, trying to promote the use of this phrase. I call it collateral damage. See, a lot of you say, well, you know, I don't think I'll be a, a target. You know, I'm not a very interesting company, although as a show of hands indicate, many of you are interesting companies for a type of cyber attackers. But you have to also think about what are collateral damage. Here's an example that many of you probably heard about. About a year and a half ago, I guess it was, Colonial Pipeline was cyber attacked and shut down. They provided about 45% of all the fuel for the east coast of the United States. Thousands of gasoline stations closed down. Thousands of companies that relied upon the gasoline and fuel from them closed down. So they individually were not cyber attacked, but they became collateral damage to cyber attacks. And I think we're going to see more and more, and this is my hypothesis, we don't have the data yet, that the collateral damage of cyber attacks is going to overwhelm by a large margin the direct impact and damage of cyber attacks. And I'll give you an example of at least some elements of that. 
Many of you may not be familiar with the term, but there was a cyber attack about two years ago called not, at least referred to as not Petria. It looked a lot like a ransomware attack, but even if you gave them bitcoins, they wouldn't unlock your computer. They just locked you up, and teach you a lesson, if you will. It turns out, and it's a long story, I'll, I'll be uh, brief as much as I can. And uh, by the way, with most cyber attacks, everything is speculation, because unless the guy raises his hand and says, I did it, here's what I did and why I did it, you have to kind of piece it together. But all the evidence indicates that this was an early uh, matter between Russia and the Ukraine either Russian government or possibly agents or individuals operating from Russia decided to attack businesses in the Ukraine, including a business that sold uh, accounting software. Think, think like QuickBooks, if you will. And of course, for accounting software, rules change all the time. Tax laws change all the time. So they have the facility to update the software. So you always have updated software. So the attacker hit this Ukrainian company when the Ukrainian company did updates to all of its customers, the malware got onto the customers, including, for example, Maersk, which had a center in the Ukraine. But once it got into the Maersk computer, it then was on the Maersk corporate network and then spread around the world. And in that process, Maersk basically was shut down for a period of time. That was about 20% of all of the world's global shipping. Now, once again, there's a certain amount of buffers in the system, but once again, people who are relying upon deliveries and so on at certain points of time were impacted by it. And of course, other companies such as Merck and, and uh, FedEx and TNT all were impacted. As far as we know, none of those companies were the intended target. It's a little bit like you release a virus, whether it be a human virus or a computer virus. Once you released it in the wild, exactly where it goes is not always controllable. And so once again, you may not be the deliberate target of a cyber attack, but you may be the collateral damage. And one of the things we talk a lot about, how many people here in your companies have concerns regarding your supply chain in general? Okay, probably pretty much all of you to some extent. There are lots of issues, because with the post-COVID issues and all kinds of other issues, there are lots of problems we're all concerned about. But one of the big issues here is how disruptive a cyber attack could be anywhere along your supply chain or may percolate up the supply chain. So we think that these are important issues. Increasingly, we're finding that large companies rely to a large extent on smaller companies for services and capability. As you may remember, one of the earliest cyber attacks was of Target, the retail store. The cyber attack occurred through their air conditioning maintenance company which had access to the corporate network and nor the schedule repairs. So they didn't do a direct assault on Target, they did an assault on the air conditioning company and from that leapfrogged onto your system. So these are all the things, I hope many of you have already thought about them, but if you haven't, these are things you wanna add into it. Now, I've got about, uh, I'm almost not running out of time, I think. Uh, I wanna ask you two questions. How many of you in your company, you can wait till both of them, encourage or enforce strong passwords or multi-factor authentication, and how many of you train employees to be careful of phishing emails? How many people do things like that? The vast majority of you. That, that's good news, but unfortunately, as God indicated, prevention is futile. I don't know how many of you know about things like Log4j or Pegasus. These are always referred to as zero-click vulnerabilities. That is, no action is required. You don't have to click on anything. You don't have to go in a link. You don't have to let someone steal your password. They'll just walk straight in the back door that you don't even know exists in your computer system. So one of the things you should be thinking about, I don't know how many of you use any of these analysis frameworks. This is one of the ones we find very popular. It's often referred to as a NIST or National Institute of Science, uh, Standards of Technology framework. It has five elements in it. Identify means appreciating or understanding that there are risks. Because if you don't know their risk, you're not going to worry about them. Secondly, where most energy goes is protection. Better firewalls, better coatings, and so on. But the other three often get neglected. I already mentioned detection. Do you realize, or how do you know that something evil is not going on right now? How well prepared are you to deal with that when it happens? And how well can you reorganize afterward? I lump those three together in the issue of resilience. I think the biggest issue companies now need to focus on is how to be more resilient. Don't assume that you won't be cyber attacked. I can't tell you when, I can't tell you what way, but assume it will happen. How well prepared are you? And that's the most important thing. And it's not just you, it's all of your organization. You gotta work together as a team to make this effective.
So in conclusion, great news, fantastic. One of the greatest things about IT, there's always new great things coming out. Better, faster, cheaper, smaller. You know, you have toothbrushes that'll clean your teeth while you're sleeping for before you know to. The question is, they all pose new risks. As a result, unfortunately, I say the worst is yet to come. But you need to understand what these risks are, and you and other aspects of management need to take the lead. And I think we're out of time, but I'm glad to talk to people during the breaks and elsewhere. I want to hope you have a great time here at MIT, but keep safe. Thank you.